Hey everyone, and welcome to your Daily Detroit for Monday, September 18th, 2023, sharing what to know and where to go in Southeast Michigan. I'm Jer Stays, and joining me on the line is... Fletcher Sharp. You know, it's not every day that a building falls, or part of a building falls to the ground. If you were in Eastern Market, you know exactly what he's talking about. I was asleep in, in Madison Heights, and I got a text from my partner who was like, did you see this? And her friend had sent her a picture of a building collapsing in Eastern. She said it sounded like a car like hit something at a high speed, and everyone kind of looked froze until people saw stuff falling. Yeah, so if you uh, don't know, the Del Bene building built right around the turn of the century, the wall on Winder Street, so it's at Russell and Winder Street, it's, it had a bunch of businesses in it. In fact, it's one of the buildings when you look at it, it's like, wow, it's really cool that we filled up this building with all these businesses. Yeah, so it, it just fell down. Now, of course, there's reasons for this, this is still being investigated. Uh, we put out some social media and some video and Wow, we'll talk about that in a second, but uh, that resonated with people without a doubt. Looking at this thing, uh, y- you can see that there are issues with you know bricks. In fact, uh, some further reporting by Jenna Brooker over on Bridge Detroit said that the owner of Jab's Gym was complaining about some bricks popping out. Uh, and I mean, I feel there, there's so many layers to this story where one, I feel bad. You've got Jador Detroit and uh, Brooklyn Outdoor. Uh, ran by somebody, uh, Candace, who's very known in the community, you know, in event space. Like people were commenting about, you know, they had their first looks there, parties, whatever. You have Jab's Gym. You have Beyond Juicery. I understand that there was a uh, barber shop, Lefties, that was going to open up a second location. They're based in Ferndale. They're going to open up a Detroit location. They were working on stuff. You got Jermac next door. You've got Detroit versus everybody, which really this feels like Detroit versus gravity now. And I go and make that joke because, like, there weren't any major inj- injuries. I think there was only one person who was minorly injured, which is, thank goodness, uh, one follower of ours had their car totaled. It was one of the cars down below. Like, this is one of the most locally relevant stories in a long time, Fletcher. And I think it highlights, like, th- there's some real questions we need to about- ask about this. And, I mean, this is not my first wall collapse I have covered over the years. There are some real questions we need to ask about because walls should not just be doing this. No, and it's a little bit unfortunate uh to hear that other businesses around there had been saying hey these this building feels kind of weird there's some stuff up there and i wouldn't say it fall fell on deaf ears but it wasn't really handled until unfortunately they collapse on themselves and as a result uh i think they're ordering an emergency demolition of the building entirely which sucks because this building's been around for a long, long time, if I remember correctly, uh, 1897. So like this is like a piece of history that we we are now removing. And I understand that like renovations for things that old uh, are expensive. Uh, we moved into a house that's 100 years old. Fixing stuff in this house, it, it makes me cry every now and then. I understand why it's a safety issue at this point. You yeah, it's structurally unsound as determined by the city. Yeah, but this is. This is a problem. And I've, I've seen other walls get repaired. Like I had a friend's apartment, their wall, their bedroom fell off. I've covered, uh, in fact, actually over at uh, Detroit Barbers in Corktown, their front uh, facade fell off. But I think one of the differences is you've got structural versus the facade. If you look at those pictures, man, it's just a big old hole. It looks like, and I'm not trying to find humor here, it looks like there's a superhero fight and someone got thrown through a window into a building. The fact that the building didn't like fully collapse on itself is like honestly... A marvel to me because looking at the space between that hole i know there's some structure there like that roof should be coming in and the fact that it just didn't right then is thankful because if some cars got destroyed through there can you imagine if that whole building had actually just come down on a busy on a busy sunday that's the other thing like i i know we got some heat for like well there's other buildings absolutely there's other buildings that have fallen in detroit and we do need to have a greater conversation about the what I believe is understaffed and not overworked building and safety department, right? Like this is something got missed. Something had to have gotten missed in the last inspections or whatever for something like this. Like this, this doesn't just happen, right? This happens, this this builds up over years. This is deterioration. And I know some people are saying, oh, an explosion. But just like your point about the superhero, those bricks were just straight down. There wasn't much that went out. And so it was pretty clear. And when I talked to experts about this, it, it was... You know, this was a a structural failing, uh, and there's a lot of supposition we could do, and I think in future episodes, I'm sure we'll get to learn more. 
It's heartbreaking on a lot of levels. And the Eastern Market uh, Corporation, which is the nonprofit, says they're going to relocate everybody. But man, the the work you got to do, the reset up of stuff. I don't think they're, I don't know if they're going to be able to grab stuff out of there. I don't think so. So you got to go through your insurance company to get stuff replaced. Like it's going to be a mess over there. Given as someone who's lived in a house that had fire damage and then we had a fire and the insurance took four years to try to actually try to Mm. pay us, try to do anything they could. I feel they'll be like, well, you know, you did save a catastrophic, but uh, was anyone else's life in danger? Were you here? No, I don't think that's catastrophic. Didn't like it's going to be a very long runaround. And there are people whose businesses are very much heavily affected, not just the business who actually had the whole happen, but everyone who lives there since the building will now be demolished. Like, I can't imagine like waking up Friday and being like, this is great. And then waking up uh, Saturday morning and Sunday morning to realize your building has been you know, a hole in it waking up today to find out, yeah, they're going to knock the whole thing down. Sorry, bud. Like that, that's got to be a a terrible whirlwind to be in. And I feel for all those business owners, that's, that's not a fun thing to wake up to at all. That's a point because people don't realize that they'll see when places do a, Hey, we're going to fundraise for X or Y. People don't realize that those companies and such, especially with these kind of deals, it's from experience. It's from friends who are business owners. They're very slow to pay. And so your business can be really affected through if it's dragged out three, six, 12 months. Like you said, a long time. The in-between time means you don't have any money coming in. You have to make up for everything. That stuff, you know, in a lot of cases, that insurance payout. And look, I know experts will tell me some do pay out quickly and they do. But others, they will drag their feet and that'll kill those businesses if there isn't that support given. That's why I'm kind of glad to see Eastern Market be like, okay, we're going to square you away with some space. We're going to figure this out and really help with more resources because it's time that kills those businesses, you know? Yes. Some will pay quickly. And that's like, Oh, you had a thing. How much is it? $20,000. Yeah, sure. Here you go. But like, let it go higher than like 500. And it's like, they're like, no, what happened? Did you plant something in here to make this blow up? Are you behind on rent? Like the questions get insane. I know I got some for the fire. People thought I started a fire in my own basement for like a year and a half. We were like, why would I do that? I wasn't even home. They're like, well, then where were you? Did you set something to be timer? And I'm like, is this a serious question? Can I leave? So like if I'm getting these ridiculous questions for a personal, I can't imagine for a business. So like, well, who who's behind? It's They're going to try to sow dissension potential. And like it's 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 so wild, and I, I'm glad that Eastern Market stepped in to help these people, but even still, like while they are stepping in to help, like you you originally want to be where you originally are. You don't want to have to move because something happened. So I, even just moving stuff out of there, I, I'm sure it's going to be a hell, and I'm, I'm, I feel so bad for these people. Well, we're going to keep up on this story. There are multiple angles to it. It is just Monday. If you've got experiences, 313 313- 789-3211. Leave a voicemail. Were you down there? You know, explain kind of, you know, what happened. What was your view? Or shoot me an email, dailydetroit at gmail.com. Fletcher, let's get into some sports. There's a couple of things I want to talk about. Unfortunately, a pair of losses. One loss I honestly don't feel that bad about. Like, I feel bad that we lost, but I don't feel so bad about that loss by the Lions against the Seahawks. Were there some bonehead calls? Sure. But we were in the game the entire time. And I think that, you know, the Lions are a playoff team, not a Super Bowl team. And playoff teams lose games sometimes. I, I was I, I was disappointed we lose, but I feel like I'm not that worried about it. I thought you were going to start off talking about Midtown softball losing this weekend. But yeah, no, the Lions <laughs> game definitely, definitely takes precedence. You mentioned that you think they're a playoff team. I'm not sure there yet. I'm someone who believes in order for you to be a playoff team, you actually have to have been in the playoffs recently. Um, and they have not yet under this regime. They're making strides. Uh, it definitely stinks to lose, especially after all the energy you come off of beating the Super Bowl champions week one. It, it, it stunk because it kind of felt a bit like the Lions of old, maybe not in scoring, but the defense only had one sack, really didn't get much of a pass rush and let Geno Smith, who I've always thought is still a decent quarterback, even after his blow up in New York, gave him way too much time to find people. And unfortunately, that's what happened on the final play where he find Tyler Lockett, who was able to stretch in uh, and knock over the pylon, which is just enough to be a touchdown. You hope players are okay. I know David Montgomery left the game with an injury. He did not come back. 
Unfortunately, uh, hear, hearing news today that James Houston is going to be out for some time really doesn't help with pass rush problem because now teams can afford to kind of single uh, Hutchinson out a bit more. When you had uh, James Houston on the other side, it allowed you to have two dynamic, quick rushers, one with a bit more power than the other, but one with some moves. So taking James Houston out, I'm sure the Lions can recover. Like the defensive line is one of their strongest points. So that probably they can plug someone in to help there, but just losing a starter never really helps. No, no. But, I mean, this part of the schedule shouldn't be too, too bad. We've got the Falcons next week. They have an unproven quarterback. We'll see how that goes. They still have Bijan Robinson at running back, who is – he's grease lightning. I've watched a few clips of him from his first two games. His first touchdown, he he had a jump stop that, like, made my knees quiver, and I'm nowhere near the Georgia Dome. So uh, the defense will have their hands full. you got to contain him and make their quarterback beat you. I agree with you 100%, but I think it's winnable. I mean, sure. I mean, that's the, that's the cool thing about the early part of the season when you're riding off of like energy is even if games are not, they could be playing against the the 2003 NFC All Star team. But like, it's, it seems like a winnable game because you see you see why they should be able to win. You see why with the parts they have, they should be able to do some stuff. I think a game could be a winnable game. I do think they'll have their hands full. Um, I'm not going to sit there and say, you know, they're definitely out of it yet, especially with the fact that they had some resilience to even get into overtime against Seattle, who was a playoff team last year. But yeah, I, it, it's going to be, I'm not going to say a dogfight, but uh, they, they have to not allow their quarterback time to throw. That's really it. They have to get the pass rush going. Um, you get the pass rush going, that's when you're able to have those DBs you signed in the offseason make plays on the ball. Otherwise, you pay them all that money for nothing. Something I didn't expect I would feel watching this game, I loved the energy and the noise of the fans. It was a big deal. It added something to the players. Now, Ford Field's always been loud, but you know, in recent years, there's been talk about you know Ford Field being a little bit tired, all that other stuff, and that even though that it's turf, it's not real grass, I... I'm starting to really like Ford Field more and being like, hey, you know what? What we really need to do is have a strong conversation about any kind of upgrades we want to do or, you know, in my perfect world, there'd be some fancy way to do grass. Like I saw uh, on uh, social media, there was this stadium that actually the field uh, went underground to grow lights. It was the coolest video I've seen in a long time. It's like a soccer field in, in Europe. But I want to see more with Ford Field as far as that game atmosphere. And and that's what counts to me so much. I feel like, you know what? Ford Field also showed up for the Lions, even though we didn't win. I think that's going to be an ace in our pocket, you know, the rest of the season. I mean, people haven't really heard Ford Field that loud because the Lions have not been consistently good at Ford Field. There hasn't really been energy at the beginning of seasons like that. They've had some where it's like, oh, we're going to do something. And then like halfway through the game, it's like, oh, man. We suck again. Like we we are we're not actually as good as we thought. This is one of the first times in recent history that I can remember that like there's sustained energy. I know they haven't played on a Thursday night in quite some time, but they haven't played a Thursday night against the Super Bowl champions like ever. So to come off of that and come into Ford Field, people were I had people who had like given up on the Lions. They've thrown them to different and they're like, oh my, I'm a Lions guy. I'll be there Sunday. I can just, it was, it was insane. It was insane to just see so many people so excited for this game. I mean, heck, I, I know over the weekend people were very happy about the fact that we, we spoke about the, the, the building collapse. There were more stories in mainstream news and other things about like the big boy figure getting a ski mask put on top of it because people were just so amped up that even that little small thing became like a story. And like, I, I was stunned. I was stunned at how just people were super smitten and they're like, we're ready. And that just really drives from the point that like Detroit is a, a football city. The, the team can be running off of fumes at this point. And people are like, I'm geeked. I'm ready. I'm ready. And like, that's, you know, that's good to see. They're behind something. Um, I even saw some of the players take to social media after the game. Like, we don't really do this very much, but we appreciate the energy you guys had there. And it makes me think back to a game in the Silver Dome, a playoff game where the ref had to, like, threw a flag. And there was like, what's the foul? And he's like, the fans have to calm down. If they don't, the Lions are going to take a penalty, at, take a timeout as a result. And I'm like, that's crazy. I've never in any in my entire life of watching a football game heard the ref say, hey, you guys got to be quiet. 
You guys got to stop making so much noise. So maybe the Lions in Ford Field, which is a bit more not as contained as the Silverdome, which is kind of just very much sound goes here and comes back down. But it's a bigger facility in that regard. So maybe they can generate some more noise. We can get another moment like that later this year. We're going to end with some Detroit City FC talk. A ah, man, that match was hard to watch. I stayed up. I got ready for it. I was like, all right, we are in the playoff chase. Phoenix rising. Maybe we can get a point out of it. And ah, we got shown. And we got shown in a big way. And I think also it helped some fans realize something I think that you have been saying the whole season. And 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 that's if we make the playoffs, it's not going to be on our talent. It's going to be, you know, a, a battle of of the worst kind of situation. I understand the desire and I want to, too, take like the men in black little device that Will Smith has and just be like, forget that game. Because I think it was the worst loss in Detroit City FC history, 5-0. But uh, the thing is, there's just so many structural problems, and I think uh, they're going to have to be addressed in the offseason if we're going to have any sort of different team next year. Yeah, for a regular season loss, 5 nothing sounds about right. Uh, in terms of emotional, I think the loss at Cass uh, against uh, Erie Admiral in the final 4-1 to one was heartbreaking because they thought they had that game in hand. In terms of a score, like I know one of those German teams came over and beat them like eleven nothing. So like that's just for scoreboard. The problem with losing five nothing at this point of the season, you can't forget it. Like if it happens earlier on, it's whatever, put it behind you. But like these last few games matter. Like while you are out <laughs> losing five nothing, uh Tulsa won one nothing. So now Tulsa is in the, the last uh playoff spot. And Detroit has one game in hand, which means Tulsa's played one more game. So Detroit has five games left. Tulsa has four. But uh, they're two points ahead. And uh, they actually have an offense. And like I've been saying multiple times, I wish people would take me seriously. Like I I know I'm kind of goofy, but like these are the things that I know for sure. Like if I'm a savant, this is the part where like my savant kicks in. Everything else, I'm not really sure. I've said scoring goals will turn losses into ties and ties into wins. And Tulsa can score goals. They have one of the better goal scorers in the league, as annoying as he is in Philip Goodrum. Detroit's problem is, in games they should be getting draws, they're getting losses. And in games they should be winning, like they're eking out ties because they cannot put the ball in the net. And that's not just a one-person fault. It's not like, oh, we got to blame the four. No, that's a, that's, a, that's a unit fault. And like that's a structural fault. Their offensive tactic is half of Muhammad Ali's rope dope where it's like absorb pressure and then you strike. They're not striking. They're just absorbing pressure and hoping to counter on a mistake. And I knew this Phoenix game would get to be like this, maybe not this bad, but against a similar team in Tampa Bay, the same thing happened. Tampa Bay has a lot of quick forwards. They press the ball hard. They wait for a mistake and they pounce. Phoenix, the same exact way. We've seen Danny Trejo before. He played for LA Force and Nisa playing at Keyworth. And while DCFC won that game, it wasn't because Danny Trejo was not good. It's because LA Force just its not a very good team. But Danny Trejo has shown that game. I've been following him around. He was a part of LAFC's team last year in the MLS that won the community, sh that won the Supporter Shield. They went on to go win the MLS Cup. He wasn't on the roster, unfortunately, because he chose to play for the Lights for the rest of the year to try to make a push with them didn't work out, but he would have been on that MLS Cup team. Very much so, very talented. So we all know how good he is. And they gave him so much space. They gave all their wingers so much space. And they just were like, we'll absorb what we can. And eventually it broke. And you watched in real time. You watched their spirit break on the field. And if your wake-up call was this Saturday and not a few weeks before, then like I, I don't know what to tell you, man. Is it still a chance for Detroit to make the playoffs? Yes, there is. They have Hartford this Saturday. They should throttle Hartford. If they're upset about what happened this Saturday, they should come out, say, you're on our field. We got to break your back the same way. We lost 5 nothing. You got to lose 5 nothing too. We can't be the only ones getting embarrassed in this seven-day span. But again, they have to come out and score goals. They have to come out and play offensively. They cannot play the style of play where it's like we'll sit back and wait and wait and wait. Teams who are like the fourth and fifth or third seed, they can afford to do that. Teams that are the eighth, ninth, tenth seed trying to make it into the playoffs, you have to fight. You have to fight. I don't mean physically like go in there and pick a bunch of yellow and red cards, but you have to go in there with the mindset of we're going to go dominate this game and put the ball in the net. 
And I still have not seen that in some time. Even the games they're winning by scoring goals off of headers and such, they weren't, they looked toothless. That bottom of the East, especially compared to the West, that bottom of the East is trash. I look at it and I go, if we make the playoffs, it'll create more political justification to not do a complete overhaul. Some of those really individually great players are USL championship caliber players. But like, if you have a system where they don't fit, then they don't fit. You could have the best triangle in the world, but you try to put it in a square peg, it's not going to go in. That's just not going to work. And there are some triangles on on this uh, square hole team that just are not going to fit. I'm not going to call you up by name, but you have a lot of people who are signed to play one position that does not exist on Detroit's team or existed in one certain way. Kind of the way that happened with, with uh, Cy Goddard. They brought him in to play one position that Detroit didn't really have. They ended up moving him somewhere else where he struggled and then he didn't play anymore. And like, that's why I thought there was a nice shift during the middle of the year to shift a position where more players are, have natural positions, but not every player still has a natural position on this team. People are coming in to play late just to fill in as subs. Cause you know, we need you to go here and play here. And like, in a way it's kind of damaging to their own career because you end up, if you need to have some footage of you when people are trying to sign you, you don't have any footage of you playing in the right spot. You look out of position. You look unnatural. You look uncomfortable. So here's the hoping that whoever steps up next to manage either gets the pieces he needs or makes formations that will accommodate most of the pieces he has. That way he's not just putting out something and saying, figure it out. Yeah, you might be a defensive mid, but go play some forward. Like, how is that going to help the team get better? Like, it's good to have glue guys who have multiple positions like Connor Rutz. It's very helpful to have someone who can play multiple positions. I also mean, you don't have one nailed down definitive position, and that's the problem. Like, where can we put you where you're going to succeed the most? Not that you can succeed everywhere somewhat great. Where are we going to put you week in, week out in the 11 where this is your spot? We got to move you for one game? Sure. But where are we going to put you when the, when the game matters most? Where are we going to put you to succeed the most? And, like, not having that right now is kind of creating a problem because you don't know who's going to score a goal for your team to win. Like, even Hartford you know, like, watch out for Hopano, watch out for Prince Sadie, watch out for, because, like, these guys are going to score goals. For Detroit, who is it? Who's who's the guy you're like, don't let him get alone? For Orange County, it was Mil- Milana Lossky before he got sold. For Louisville, it's Philip Goodrum, Cam Lamcaster, Brian Ownby. For Tampa Bay, it's Cal Jennings, JJ. Who, who do we have that you say, look out for them? It's one of the center backs. Like, don't let them get a header. Like, that's that's not how you win. And I think people are not realizing that, like, if they get in there, they'll be very lucky. And again, it won't be because they got in there. It'll be because Tulsa said we don't want to go to the playoffs anymore. Yeah, I think there's going to be some some reckonings that are going to have to happen. Or maybe they won't. Maybe they won't, and that's where we'll be. Uh, it's all about what the priorities are. And I'd like to hear what people's priorities are. DailyDetroit at gmail.com. You know, is this something where we want to put together the resources for a winning team? Because we got to... We're in a tough spot, right? Like, and there was an interview in the Detroit News. I will link to it in the show notes. But it's clear to me the focus is sustainability, as it should be. But I feel like you got to do both, and there needs to be there there needs to be more money in the system. It just that's it. Like we're getting outclassed at this point. Yeah, and uh, I, I know people love the gritty Detroit attitude, I, and like I do too. I'm very much someone who's like, look at this person who represents this region. They're up there going into a fight getting beat up and absorbing blows. And at some point though, you, you got to either change your tactics or like maybe throw a punch. Cause like, it's not very Detroit to get beat up every single week. It's, it's very Detroit to like try, but it's not Detroit to go up there and be like, Oh, they lost again badly. They didn't look like they were having it. Like that's not the spirit of the city. And yeah, there needs to be some uphaul. I'm not sure what, uh, I'm not sure where, but I know there's a new coach coming in and whoever they bring in hopefully has a system that they want to put in that's going to sustain where they are, but also help them build. All right. With that, thank you so much for listening to your Daily Detroit on this Monday. Fletcher Sharp, always good to talk to you, man. Yep. Thanks for having me again. As always, we are supported by our members, patreon.com slash daily Detroit. That's patreon.com slash daily Detroit. They keep us going. It is much appreciated as well as our sponsors. With that, I'm Jer Stays. Remember that you are somebody and we'll see you around Detroit.